How are you? Um, we're expecting more people, so hopefully they'll just come in. Hi, Monica. How are you? So I was going to talk, we were going to talk today, first of all, about um, funding, and specifically with a focus on non-NIH funding, because I think everybody hears about NIH funding, and of course, NIH doesn't fund a lot of outcomes research. They're starting to do more. But I think people are not as aware of the other kinds of sources for funding for this kind of research. Um, and we also wanted to touch on publications, where you might submit publications to, and how you might make that decision. And then, you know, hopefully have some time at the end to, to get your questions and lead the discussion any way you want. Okay? So please feel free to stop me. If anything I say is unclear, I'm just going to give you an overview. Uh, okay. So I want to say that I'm probably the only optimistic person around right now in terms of funding for research. And that's because health services research has been, or outcomes research, has been funded abysmally forever. And so it didn't get any worse for people like me. It's actually getting a little better. So I'm kind of optimistic about it because uh, both uh, NIH and non-NIH federal sources are, are finally kind of saying, hey, we need something a little bit more practical. People actually want to know what works in order to guide practice. And um, it's starting to be, just starting to be, a little bit less disease and device driven in terms of the classic NIH direction. So I'm going to talk briefly about AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the CDC. The AHRQ is the only federal agency that actually has as their mandate to fund primary care research. Uh, the CDC is largely focused on prevention, again, which is certainly not a focus of NIH in general. And then there's a, a few new kids on the block. The PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is going to be very Unless the Affordable Care Act falls apart, this is going to be a huge, major source of funding for outcomes research. And some new things at NIH, yes, NIH, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research now has funding opportunities in dissemination and implementation, which is um, much of what we do in T3, T4 kind of research. Um, so the limitations of NIH for the kind of research many of you all are interested in is there are no institutes of disease prevention. There are no institutes of quality improvement or health services research. Can you find little bits of money at NIH that are applicable? Yes, you can. Usually, if you pick a disease and make your outcomes about that disease state, that can work out just fine. But if you're not particularly a disease if you don't have a particular disease that you can focus on and you want to look more at issues of healthcare delivery in general, it's very hard to get find funding at NIH. Um, and that is because uh, it's, been, it, it's been organized around organ system and disease-oriented classifications. And you, you can ask why, and that's largely financial. I mean, it's been driven by devices and pharmaceuticals, largely. So this is just the, the sad news, is that up till now, T, T2 through T4 has been about 1.5 percent of all the federal and foundation funding. So that's really pretty abysmal. It's starting to change, I think. Um, so you know, there have been some, there has been an increased focus at NIH on, um, it, with the coming of the new pathway for the CTSIs on clinical and community translation, and all of the CTSIs now have to have a community translational portion, for example, and even that requirement really has forged new conversations that just never happened before the CTSIs. So this is a slow evolutionary change, but I do see a real change at NIH. And the other thing I wanted to let you know is it is entirely possible to have a successful research career without ever getting funded by NIH. I know plenty of outcomes health services researchers that do. So um, although the parlay at institutions, and actually this institution is a fairly conservative one, the University of Colorado, in terms of this. Like when I go to high-level research meetings, they're always talking about NIH funding. That's all they talk about. They do not include most of the other sources of funding that outcomes researchers are funded by, which is always mildly uh, irritating and disappointing, but it's true. Um, so you have, to, you have to kind of steel yourself against that and, and tell yourself, that doesn't mean it's second-class research. It just means that NIH doesn't focus on it. 
Okay, so AHRQ, um, as I said, is the only federal entity with a specific mandate to focus on primary care. And unfortunately, funding levels have been very low in the last 10 years. However, there, has, there was this recent influx with the um, Affordable Care Act of comparative effectiveness dollars, and that was about $300 million. And many of the people around this institution got some of those dollars. Um, however, you know, right now, uh, it's a little bit of a question how much HRQ is going to grow. They, uh, they did, for example, they, they were one of the few uh, federal funding agencies that funded career development awards specifically more in the area of outcomes health services research. And those have been suspended. They've been reinstated just recently. But there's, there's a question about whether those will continue. So that's kind of a bit of bad news. However, um, I just got a $4.5 million grant from AHRQ. So I mean, you can get funding from AHRQ. Um, actually, we'll skip this, but these are their areas of uh, focus. Comparative effectiveness is a big area of focus for them. And in addition, as we'll talk about when we get to PCORI, they are funneling HRQ money into PCORI as well for comparative effectiveness. They have a focus on prevention and care management, on value, and that has, you know, patient values, that kind of thing. Health information technology has been a major focus, and patient safety has been a major focus. So they have a, a fairly small portfolio. About their budget in 2010 was almost four, 400 million, but that's pretty small compared to NIH levels. And um, you can see how, how it was distributed here. A lot of the focus in the past, is this a, a lot of the focus in the past has been in HIT and patient safety, but they're now really expanding in comparative effectiveness. Okay, so AHRQ, <coughs> excuse me, has uh, RO1s, <coughs> RO3s, RO8s, the, the classic kind of um, larger and smaller grants, and they have had career development awards, which are, as I said, kind of not as robust lately. But I, I would say I'm, I'm actually on an AHRQ um, health services study section, and I would say the RO3, RO8, R21 kind of mechanisms are being funded at the same level as other institutes, something like 15%. It's the R01s that are really low. I have friends in the last year who were, who were um, in the absolute funding range, you know, and they did not get funded. So that's the, the large grants are what I'm concerned about in the HRQ, but the smaller ones are definitely being funded. Okay, then there's the CDC. CDC is the major federal source for health services research during the years when AHRQ has been so low. So most of my funding has come from CDC because I do immunization delivery and prevention research. NIH didn't do that. I mean, even though they're all about, you would think infectious disease would be about prevention of infectious disease. Well, they don't do immunization delivery. CDC does immunization delivery. Um, and they have, <clears throat> so they're, they focus a lot on prevention. And then they have sort of selected common diseases that they focus on, like epilepsy has been a major focus of theirs. And they, they'll, they have some just sort of topics that they love. Injury. They like injury. They like uh, breastfeeding. It's been a focus of theirs. So largely in the prevention area and then a few select disease states. Um, and they are, you know, smaller. Their public health research is $31 million. And then there's these prevention center grants that are about $31 million as well, and I'll tell you more about them in a minute. But you know, fairly small funding, but if you, there aren't that many people that do this work, and so actually we compete very well for these kind of grants. So they have de several different mechanisms. Um, they have cooperative agreement mechanisms with these three entities. Um, and that, you know, whether they do it with AMC or ASPH or APTCR, you know, that's just the funding mechanism, but they're the same. They, they just basically administer the grants. And then they have these prevention research centers, and they have special interest projects that they distribute through the prevention research centers, okay? Now, it's important to know about these because we have one. The University of Colorado has one. And there are 37 centers nationally. And if you've got one of these, then you can apply through the University of Colorado. And you're not competing with millions. You're competing with 37 centers. So that's, that's a real leg up. So the prevention centers are these inner, uh, in, interdependent 
networks of community, academic, and public health partners that conduct preventive kind of research and promote evidence-based strategies. Um, so ours is, uh, the PI is Julie Marshall at the School of Public Health. One of the big grants I've had sort of continually for about eight years is one of the special interest projects through the Prevention Center. So that's a very, if, if when the SIPs, they're called SIPs, special interest projects, come out, um, they're really great because you, 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 know, you have a good chance. You have a much better chance at competing for them. And you do it through the Prevention Center. Okay? So the, uh, the PRC projects have both core projects and these special interest and thematic network projects. Um, and then sometimes they also fund, it, fund associated projects where the PRC itself has a sp specific project. But I think the, the thing that's the most relevant to you all are the SIP projects. Um, so what's a SIP? It's a project in health promotion, disease prevention research that focuses on a major cause of death and disability, improves public health within communities, and supports the development of effective state and local public health programs. Um, it's generally funded by CDC or other agencies in the health and human services, and they are only offered to the PRCs. So they come out usually yearly in the spring. And you can find out from the Prevention Center here when are the SIPs coming out. This year was a very disappointing year, I'll just tell you. There are very few SIPs, none in my area, which is very unusual. So some years are good, some years are bad. Um, but very important funding mechanism to know about. Um, this is about a thematic network, and that's where um, several centers collaborate together to go in on a project. And there are five networks, whoops, currently, and you can see uh, Cancer Prevention and Control, Healthy Aging <coughs> Network for Epilepsy Self-Management, Nutrition Obesity Policy Research Network, and Physical Activity Policy Research Network. So sometimes they bring centers together and do these thematic um, funding, funding uh, opportunities. So healthcare reform, <clears throat> very big implications for, of the Affordable Care Act for funding. The, um, this act established the pa Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. And their first jobs were to identify priorities for the research agenda of this institute, and then to implement research agenda via, with the help of AHRQ and NIH. And right now, the Affordable Care Act um, supplies for continued funding for uh, comparative effectiveness research until 2019 with an annual budget in the realm of 500 million. So this is, this is kind of a big deal. Um, where is this money coming from? In addition to some contributions, uh, it's actually gonna be funneled mostly through AHRQ and NIH, but it's actually coming from a tax on insurers. So the idea here is that the insurers should actually pay for evidence about what works and doesn't work, and that that's an appropriate use of their money. So, People are hoping that if the Affordable Care Act is not repealed, by 2014 the budget will be about $400 million and will get up to $500 million. So here are their funding priorities, and this is still open for public comment. And they're in fact, I believe the meeting in Colorado is soon. I don't know, you can actually show up at the meeting and give your input. Uh, approximately 40% is targeted for comparative assessment of options for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, which is comparative effectiveness research. So that's where you um, directly compare, for example, a treatment approach to usual care, or one treatment approach to another, or one approach to prevention versus another. So this is, this is a, actually a lot of what, what we do in health services research. Uh, about 20% is gonna be uh, devoted to improving healthcare systems, 10% to communication and dissemination research, 10% to addressing disparities, and about 20% to accelerating patient-centered outcomes research and methodologic research. So that is developing the methodologies to do these kinds of research. So that's, that's, a very, that's probably the most exciting thing on the horizon. <coughs> Unless the Affordable Care Act is repealed, God forbid, then that the question is, what will happen to that funding? And nobody knows the answer to. If, if it is not repealed, that looks like a very good source of funding for what many of us might choose to do. We could spin it that way. 
Okay, so then there's this new um, direction of the NIH Office of uh, Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and they have been uh, recently funding opportunities in dissemination and implementation beginning in 2011. They have R01s, R21s, R03s, R18s, and they also have put a fair amount of money into training institutes for dissemination and implementation research. So this is research that's focusing on uh, dissemination of evidence-based practices into care, which is what many of you are interested in or trying to do, or um, looking at novel ways of dissemination, for example, through HIT, that kind of thing. Um, it's looking at the science of implementation. So how do you actually implement a project that's only been tested in a uh, more confined way to other, in other settings, for example. So that, that kind of research, which is actually a lot of health services research as well, is now being funded by this part of NIH. Okay, I just want to say a little bit about foundation grants. Um, there's a huge variability in the size, scope, and focus of foundations. So, you know, foundation funding is a sort of art in itself in terms of Small, small foundations are completely different from very big national foundations. Um, and for example, so, sometimes we can spin research um, to local foundations that don't fund research as evaluation. So you might write a proposal extremely differently, and it's not disingenuous, you're actually trying to evaluate a program, but they don't like the word research, and you would not put a lot of researchy terms into that. So how you spin uh, your proposal and, and, and how you decide where to apply is quite individually catered depending on the foundation. Um, most importantly, submit within their designated areas of interest. I mean, don't try to sell something to a, a foundation that's interested in MS. Don't try to sell, you know, cerebral palsy. I mean, this is not, you have to give them what they're focused on. Invariably, uh, they have board of directors who are often volunteers and they're passionate about something for a reason, particularly local foundations. And so uh, respond to what they're passionate about and, and, and pick accordingly. Give them what they want. So the application process is extremely varied. Some of the large uh, national foundations like RWJ or uh, William T. Grant Foundation, their, their proposals are like NIH proposals. I mean, they're very extensive, they're reviewed. Uh, by study panels that are every bit as sophisticated as NIH study panels, whereas some of the local foundations are much more informal, often very short, and they may rely a lot more on you coming and making a presentation, for example. Um, foundations, particularly smaller ones, the personal connections with program officers are extremely important. I've had the experience with local foundations here where um, the project manager believes in the project I'm doing. She, uh, she's happy with things. And I come to her with an idea to expand the research, and she says, yeah, do it. She goes to the board. It, it isn't even involved. It doesn't even involve a grant. It can sometimes be that fluid. So the personal relationships, particularly with small foundations, are extremely important, and forging those is very important. Um, you need, you know, they, they care a lot about your track record with that agency. Um, and so using connections and um, making those contacts early is very important. And as I said, you can have add-ons to your initial funding if they see the importance of what you're doing and that you're making progress. So we talk, talked a little bit about this. So this is some of the larger uh, health service um, foundations, Foundations that focus on health services research would include like RWJ or William T. Grant. There are a lot of uh, local smaller ones, particularly I would say the Rose Community Foundation, which has funded a, a lot of um, research. I mean, they, they actually don't, they're one of the ones that don't like to talk about research as much as evaluation, but they are very interested in local problems, you know, decreasing disparity for healthcare delivery. They funded several projects for me when I was evaluating the effects of the state child health insurance plan, for example. They care about the local issues of children, and that's the way you pose that kind of a grant. Um, the Colorado Health Foundation is probably the, 
the, the big guy around here, they have the most money. Currently, in order to talk with them, you need to go through either the Children's Foundation or the university people because they're trying to, um, there have been so many requests for funding from this agency that they're now trying to kind of triage things. But they definitely have a lot of money, and if you, if you float an idea to them, um, the Children's Hospital Foundation will tell you if you should go ahead and proceed, and they'll help you if, they, if they're convinced about what you're doing. Okay, I want to stop there, because I just gave you a very quick overview of a lot of different things. Do you have some specific questions about your work or about how to <coughs> operationalize any of this? Yeah. This is actually just a, uh -huh. when you were talking about AHRP and their portfolio, you mm -hmm. mentioned one was prevention and care management. Mm -hmm. So is it prevention and care management together, or did they just put those two things under one umbrella? So in other words, if it's care management, it can have to be something about prevention or vice versa? No, I think that is an umbrella topic. Okay. Yeah. But you know what you, what, what you, and I would have brought all this documentation from AHRQ, but it's actually easier just to go online right. and see what their, you know, what their current okay. RFAs. I mean, they do have open uh, R01s and, you know, mm -hmm. small projects, big projects. Those are the ones that are not getting funded quite as well. It's best if you respond to one of their RFAs. Okay. Um, that's, that's the best way to go. And again, the smaller projects. But I would, I would definitely start paying attention to the other, the office, I mean, if you're interested in, this, what, what kind of research do you do? Or? Well, I would just, you know, I've been working on an outcomes project related to transition from pediatric to adult care. Uh -huh. So that's care management related, but it is really prevention. I mean, it may prevent problems, but I just wondered what that, how that was broken. So up. is, for example, is there an intervention you're going to propose? Um, I implemented some things with the epilepsy group, some mm -hmm. health information technology aspects and self-management education, so. Okay, so I'm hearing implementation step. dissemination. Yeah. So another place to look would be the, that NIH office of, okay. you know, anything, it, it's starting to be like there are code words, you know. Okay. A lot of what, what I do, for example, can be fit into one of several buckets. Comparative effectiveness research. Well, we do a lot of pragmatic trials of interventions, and we compare one thing to another thing. Or we compare a new intervention to usual care, but that's two, two uh, treatment strategies. That can be comparative effectiveness, or it can be implementation research, because it's about implementing something into a practice setting. So, you know, spinning some of this is, is kind of a talent. And, and it's, it's all patient-centered outcomes research, so for Corey, um, hopefully will apply to much of what we're doing. It has to have a patient-centered aspect to it. But again, we, we always have a qualitative component looking at the effect on, um, you know, from, from patients' perspective and get their input when we're, when we're trying to implement something. So that's not a hard... Um, it seems as though this network for epilepsy self-management Yeah. Spot on. I, they have actually a webinar. Right. And have you looked, I, I don't know if you looked at the special interest projects this year. I don't, I mean, I sort of glaze over when I'm, I'm looking for immunization delivery so I didn't look for epilepsy, but they often have epilepsy. What? Right. Yeah, I did, no, I haven't done that yet. That's just sort of coming yeah. to these so I can start thinking about this for the future. Right. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I was curious, with less common diseases that, you know, aren't, well known within a lot of medical communities, and especially some of these foundations that, like I, we deal with pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. which isn't the most common disease in pediatrics. I mean, it's known a little bit more in the adults as a secondary disease. So I'm wondering if there's a better approach than tackling it as we're trying to learn about this disease, since I think the CDC, you know, typically picks certain common diseases. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's a better approach with something that's a little less common. Well, you know, it depends on your focus because NHLBI, of course, has been pretty good at picking pretty esoteric things. You know, in fact, in my, from my perspective, 
they're usually looking at, uh, they're usually funding very esoteric things. But, you know, so NIH might be a perfect place for you to go. You know, if your focus is on basic research, definitely. If your focus is on sort of early translation, also probably NIH. Um, it's when you want to, you know, move into the community or want to move into prevention that you have more of a trouble at NIH. I mean, here you've got a, you've got a disease state and you've got an organ system. So that's where NIH is good. And, you know, I mean, I know Steve gets most of his money from NIH, right? Yeah. So actually, you may be in a good position to go to NIH, right. as long as you're not trying to, like, you know, study the epidemiology of, uh, you know. All of our funding is NIH. So yeah. I was just trying to see if there's other. Well, I mean, if you can get good funding at NIH, that's the best, because they have the most money. Right. I mean, that big pie graph, 98% of it's going to basic science. Or, or, you know, pretty basic science. So that's where I would go to NIH, honestly. Yeah. Um, especially for s smaller projects, to what extent do you think that pilot data, like especially even unfunded pilot data, is important as you, as you begin to write those grants, as opposed to just having an idea and starting something and, and, and trying for foundation grants right away? Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, the pilot grants that are supposed to be like these small, small RO3s or even a, a slightly larger R21 from NIH or most of these agencies, they say they're pilot developmental grants, but if you submit one of those without good pilot data, they say, uh-uh, we're not funding this. So, yes, you do, that your, any application will be greatly strengthened by having pilot data Foundations are a little bit, you know, if you're talking about a local foundation, that's much more to do with are you pitching what they want to do? And that's, that's an area where you might be able to actually get a true pilot if, if you're, I don't know, want to sound cynical or anything, but if you're pulling the right heartstrings that are exactly correspond to what, you know, they believe that this is the right way to go and you want to do that. And yeah, you want to evaluate it, but they believe that already, kind of. So that's, um, it's a, that would be a very different approach. But yes, in the federal agencies, when they say pilot, they kind of mean bigger pilot, usually. They, you do a lot better if you've got pilot um, data. And where I would suggest you go, if you're really at the very beginning stage, is like an institutional pilot grant. Like the Research Institute has $30,000 pilot grants, that's perfect for that. And what, what they want to fund is a true pilot that's going to allow you to apply for funding. So an institutional grant would be perfect for that, and a research institute is, is a great place to go. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about publication. Okay, so we'll just spend a couple of minutes quickly talking about publication and, you know, we can have also have a question and answer period about that, but we want to leave time at the end for feedback and overall questions. But in terms of publication, we thought we would just sort of, you know, talk about a couple of the very common journals that at least, you know, Ali and I and our colleagues have had experience publishing in or at least submitting to. Um, and so the first group are clinical pediatric academic journals. So the most common um, journals that you would probably be submitting to are things like pediatrics or archives of pediatrics and adolescent medicine, Journal of Adolescent Health, and the Journal of Pediatrics, which, and so we've sort of divided these into more clinical academic journals and more health services and public health journals. But that's not to say that there's not a tremendous amount of overlap. You know, I would say, you know, for certainly the work that I've done has, is more less clinically focused and more sort of outcomes research focused and public health focused. And I've had good luck with art journals like pediatrics and, and archives. 
um, less in adolescent health because that's not really my, my area. Um, I haven't had as much luck with Journal of Pediatrics, but Ali was sharing with me earlier today that Journal of Pediatrics is moving, it, it tends to have a very clinical, a, a reputation of being a very clinical journal, and they're starting to move more toward outcomes research and public health. Is that fair yeah, to I say? Yeah, I would say they're, they're, um, their reputation is more subspecialty oriented. So subspecialists tend to read JPs more than pediatrics. But they're trying to break out of that because I've, I've been noticing they're trying to accept more health services research. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So then in terms of health services and, and more public health focused journals, um, certainly the top one, you know, health affairs and medical care are, you know, health services research is another one. Um, that those are, you know, pretty top tier health, health services and outcomes research journals. BMC Public Health is another. Um, BMC Public Health, the, the tricky part about this is these are this is a journal that you need to pay to, it, you, the university has to have a subscription, um, to an institutional subscription to submit there. And if they don't, um, then you have, to, you have to pay to have your, not to submit, but to have your, your article published in BMC Public Health. Academic Pediatrics um, also, um, Health Services, this is, you know, more pediatric focused. Um, uh, American Journal of Preventive Medicine and Preventive Medicine. So questions about that? Or are there other ones that you were wondering about or that you had considered submitting to? I mean, certainly if you have a specific area of focus, there's a whole lot of journals in your specific area that might be, you know, it depends a lot on who you want your audience to be, how broad you want your audience. We're giving you the higher impact <coughs> here because if you can get them in there, more people will see it. Mm -hmm. So sort of along those lines, where should you submit if you're trying to decide? And, you know, I would say, you know, t targeting the, those groups, the, the journals that we presented initially is a, is a good start because most of them, as Ali was saying, ha do have a high impact factor. And, you know, the impact factor of your journal um, will also depend on sort of your career trajectory and if that matters for sort of promotion and things like that and sort of who the target audience is. Do you want to focus mostly on clinicians? Do you want to get your message out to more of a public health audience? Um, you know, is it something you want pediatricians to hear, for example, or do you want broader sort of outcomes research researchers to know about, or epidemiologists, for example, or um, you know that that will help guide you know who where where you send. And there are a number of search engines for choosing the appropriate journal. And I apologize, I have a really good one. I couldn't find the link to it this morning. So we'll, when we post the slides, we'll post the that search engine. But it's a really sophisticated search engine in the sense that you can type in keywords about your project. So it might be something like immunization delivery, pragmatic trial, and you might have one other keyword. And it'll spit back to you a number of journals that would be appropriate. So based on you know, abstracts or keywords and abstracts and journal articles and you know, where other people have published in that. And I've had you know, the few times that I've used it, I've actually had it's the, the journal that's come back has been pretty appropriate. So it seems like it's a pretty, pretty sophisticated search engine. So we'll post that link when we post the slides because um, that might be another area if you're you know, trying to think. Um, about p potential journals that might not have been on the list that we provided. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up was once you do submit your journal, and hopefully you, it gets a, you know, hopefully it'll just get accepted first round, which hardly ever happens. Um, has that ever happened to you, that you've gotten it just submitted, like, as like as accepted is? as is, right? So that never happens. Um, more often, well, I shouldn't say more often, depending on the journal, what you, the next best thing is a revise and resubmit. So you'll get crit, you know, critiques, and it usually goes out to three or so people, depending on, depending on the journal and depending on the field. Um, but generally, three people will review it, three people with expert expertise in your area. And they'll provide a whole host of comments for you and feedback about things that um, they liked and more often things that they want to see changed or clarified in, in, a, rev in a revision. Um, or it could just be out and out rejected. Um, 
And so this, this resource, this is um, actually one, a co the second author of this is the um, editor of Archives of Pediatric in adolescent medicine, he, he and his colleague wrote a really nice piece about responding to reviewer comments. So this is the link to it, and I would really encourage you to, um, to read it because it's, it provides some really helpful guidance about how, how do you respond to things. I mean, certainly many of the things you probably will agree with, and you maybe just didn't have space to address them, or you weren't able to address them, but you would have liked to. Some things might be things that you aren't necessary, weren't necessarily part of the research project, but might be sort of this an area of expertise for this particular reviewer, and how you how you navigate that, how you address their their concerns and validate what they're saying, and then respond in a way that makes the manuscript ultimately makes the manuscript stronger. So we just wanted to provide that resource for you. Um, and that's pretty much all we have in terms of publication. If there are specific questions about the process or anything around choosing a journal or other tips around publication, we're, you know, we're happy to answer any questions about that. Is there anybody in the process where they've written something up and they're about to submit? Not yet. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think what we wanted to do was spend the last few minutes um, talking about some, you know, kind of wrapping up the series and talking about, you know, if, if, you're, if you feel comfortable sharing feedback for us. We do have a formal evaluation form that we'd like you to fill out that will, you know, a answer a lot of these about, you know, things that you liked and topics that were most helpful, topics that weren't quite as helpful, future topics that you'd like to see. But if there's you know, if you feel comfortable kind of sharing any of that, things that you found very helpful or things that were less helpful, that would be, it would be great to have a discussion about that, um, as well as any future topics. So I just threw, put some up there, um, NIH funding, if that's something, as Ali was saying, that could be a talk, whole talk onto itself. Um, but if, you know, you're not discouraged by the <laughs> state of affairs with NIH funding and want to learn more about, more about those, you know, we could devote an entire series to study designs, you know, maybe with a focus more on pragmatic trials, for example, or methods, secondary data analysis, again, could be a whole module on its, onto itself, or statistical analyses, kind of taking it to the next step in terms of the things that we introduced already. Comparative effectiveness, as Ali was saying, that's a really hot topic now. Um, implementation science, again, could be a whole a whole module, a whole series unto itself. Um, Quali qualitative research is also something that you know, how to conduct published new studies. Hmm. So we can just, you know, oh, oh do you want to say more? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So one, one thing um, we would particularly like feedback about is how, at what level we're aiming these discussions. Because we sort of didn't know who would show up. And we'd like to know if, if you'd like, if, if this was aimed at the right level, if you'd like us to be uh, more sophisticated, maybe a little bit more basic. We don't, we don't know what your, your needs are on that level. So that would be very helpful. I'm sure that to some extent, people who weren't satisfied with that have uh, removed themselves. So we need to ask them. <laughs> you know, people are showing up for various uh, different talks. But that's the kind of input we need since we're, this is a trial balloon. We'd really like to make this the most useful we can, okay? Yeah, does anybody, does anyone have comments they'd like to share? Uh, yeah, do you mind using the, the microphone? Yeah, thanks. I think for the stuff that I do a lot of data analysis, and I would like to have some kind of statistical consultant of some sort to kind of I mean, I've taken so many st statistics classes, and I feel like, you know, I do the same statistics on everything. It's usually, you know, your, your student t-tests and very basic stuff. So is there um, any, anybody out there, because I know in public health, a lot of the program is based off of understanding how to analyze your data. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, people out there that could help with that. Well, the, um, I mean, we probably wouldn't 
have a seminar like this at that level because most people wouldn't be able to, I mean, that, that would be sort of a, a more select group. But the Children's Outcomes Research Program definitely has that kind of consultation available, as does the Research Institute. There are uh, four or five biostatisticians that you can consult with at the Research Institute, and Children's Outcomes Research Program also has consultation. It depends a little bit about if you're specifically talking about analysis, you probably would go to the Research Institute and talk with their biostatisticians. Um, we do have some of that as well, but I think that's, that would probably be the easiest way to do it. But if you're having any trouble, contact me directly, okay? And then there's also that biostatistics short course, right, through, yeah, so that's another resource that's offered through Children's Hospital, is that right, or through? So CCTSI what might be another resource. So if you're looking, so that would be less consultative, so a little bit different than what Ali's talking about. But if you wanted to dedicate six weeks to learning more, you know, how to analyze data more than just a t-test, that's, that's pretty much, I think, the description of the biostatistics short course. So that might right. be another. And then you could come back and ask, you know, and combine the two in terms of other, um, you know, consultation now that you sort of have your eyes are open to other types of analyses, that might be an approach as well. Um, how do we go about setting up some sort of consultation for COR? You can email us. Email either uh -huh. myself or Allie. Yeah, and that absolutely. would involve just like a like an hour sit down mm -hmm. to chat about your art project, you know, where are you going, what's your design kind of a thing. Exactly. Yep. All right. <laughs> Um, I, in response to your question about was this the right level or um, I think that it for me um, I really enjoyed it because it was it was offered as sort of a general overview and that's indeed what it was and um, I like the fact that you both used some of your own personal examples um, in each of the presentations but um, what often ends up happening in these kinds of situations is one or two people um, sometimes dominate the, the, like they have their own agenda that they bring and they keep on sort of plugging away. And I don't feel like that was the case. And so, yes, it was broad, but it was broad in a good way. And I think you've given people plenty of means or resources to then continue with their own path and get more information that they might need. So, um, you know, yes, there definitely could be a follow-up that's in more depth in, in any of the weeks that we, uh, topics, but in terms of what you build this as, I think you kept it in that framework very well. So, great, thanks. And, and I was just going to, to say also that I think in the future, given that you've already done this, that there may be the potential to have a beginning course and a, a little bit more advanced course for those people who have participated already in some research and, and, and are looking at you know higher level kinds of activity. So, so I can see the possibility of that and, and, and maybe promoting it in that way, you know, very beginning level and intermediate level or something like that. I, I personally felt like the um, area that, that I would love more time on probably was the study design. Um, that feels like there's so much there that you know I think like it could have been done in two sessions or something like that maybe in the future. Yeah, thanks. That's it. Felt like that I think when we were <laughs> doing it in design. It, right. I mean that could be an entire s module. Yeah. Where are the the powerpoints posted? I think I may have missed that along the way. You said when you post the powerpoint, you'll have a corrected something. Okay. Okay. So you'll you'll send us an email when they are perfect. That's just wanted to make sure I, I wasn't missing that. You know what would be uh, really helpful to us is to put these all these suggestions down to, particularly about if there are topics um, that you would like to devote several sessions to. Let's say focus groups or surveys or you know some of these other ones. 
Uh, let us know about it, and then we can kind of poll people and find out if that's a topic that generally we can work something up in those areas. So we definitely can tailor these as time goes on. It's really nice to have lunch served. I mean, you didn't have to like run, ar run around like trying to get your lunch and get here in time. So yeah. that was huge. So, however, that was funded. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Thank you. you have yeah, the floor. Well, thank you okay. so much for your attendance and questions.